right. Good morning, conference. My name is KJ. I'm a PGY2. Today, I'm going to be doing a procedure lecture on lateral canthotomy and cantholysis. Um, before I get started, I just want to thank the Small Talk team for helping me with my presentation. So this is just an overview of what we'll be discussing. And we'll go ahead and get started with a case. This was actually a case I had as a sub I in fourth year of medical school. Um, but the case was uh, involved a 29 year old male. He was status post blunt trauma to the right eye. Uh, basically, he was involved in a bar fight where someone threw a vase and hit him across the face. Immediately after, the patient reported just diminished visual acuity of the right eye as well as progressive swelling. Otherwise, denied any LOC. Um, and these were his vitals. So on exam, um, patient was A&O times three, basically came in just covering his right eye. Um, ABC's intact, fast negative. Uh, what was really remarkable on exam in terms of the right eye, he had severe proptosis, there was injection, it was a commodic edematous sclera, he had hemorrhage of the anterior chamber, um, diminished visual acuity with minimal sensitivity to light. However, his extraocular uh, movements were intact. Uh, in terms of the left eye, not much other than injection, his pupils were fine extraocular muscles intact and this remainder exam was really unremarkable. So I did I described it but what what did he look like? So that was him. So given the history and the picture of what we just saw or just in general um, little audience participation what is maybe some differential diagnosis for blunt ocular trauma? Any of our new interns want to say anything? The fracture? Okay, it's good. Anyone else? Any of our PGY3s? What was that? Nice. Awesome. So, yes. Uh, just to name a few, obviously we're talking about a lateral canthotomy, um, orbital compartment syndrome and like the setting of a retrobulbar hematoma, globe rupture, orbital wall fracture, um, retinal detachment, hyphema, uh, vitreous hemorrhage, just uh, a couple to name. So essentially what happened to my patient? Um, a little bit of a buzzkill. This was not a, a, orbital, a situation of orbital compartment syndrome, but basically when this patient came in, we kind of were unsure. He had this like glaring, very scary eye, and we were trying to figure out, is this a situation where there's orbital compartment syndrome? Is this a globe rupture? Um, because obviously the management are different, um, and it's really important to kind of tell. This was a, like a small community hospital in Manhattan. Uh, that did have opto, but they weren't in the building. So if this was going to be a situation where uh, a canthotomy had to be done, we as the ER doctors had to do it. Um, thankfully, they were, opto was able to get there within like 15 minutes. Um, we were describing the presentation to the team and they uh, had a low index of suspicion for uh, retrobulbar hematoma. So they actually did decide to like get a CT scan. They actually did pressures on, on this patient. Um, and this was his scan, uh, basically Basically, you can see uh, here, I don't know where the mouse is. Okay. Um, okay, the mouse is acting funny, but looking at the uh, right orbit, you can see there's like proptosis. Um, the optic nerve is kind of stretched a little bit. There's evidence of a, oh, I was like, who is that? <laughs> there, how did you do that? Okay, I'm just gonna, thank you. The, um, there's evidence of like a vitreous hemorrhage. The globe is sort of um, disfigured. Um, and then they did uh, pressures on the patient's eye. The first time they did it, it was 10 in the affected eye. And I remember they did it again and it was seven. Um, so this patient, they ended up taking to the OR he, uh, for a vitrectomy because he had a vitreous hemorrhage and later found to have a actual, actually have a, a globe rupture. Um, for the new interns, when you're doing IOPs, uh, we have, this is a tono pen. Um, this will be found in the PIXIS and CCT. Um, basically, you line this uh, like top part with uh, the, like near the frontal bone, and then there's this like little plastic sort of stick, I guess you describe, and it just taps on the whites of the eyes and it gives you an average and it'll show up on the screen here. So that'll be helpful to you during your eye exam. 
So lateral can thought of me, why do we do this? When do we do this? When do we not do it? Um, obviously, we're gonna, this is a vision saving technique that you're gonna do in the setting of increased uh, orbital pressure. The lateral canthotomy is actual cr uh, cutting of the lateral canthus, and the cantholysis is the cutting of the canthal ligament. Um, most importantly, uh, you wanna avoid any delays. So if you suspect this is orbital compartment syndrome, you don't wanna stop to get CTs, you don't wanna stop to transfer a patient or wait four hours for opto. Opto, um, this is something that you have to intervene quickly. Um, if opto is in-house, uh, like we have here at Kings County, then you obviously want to consult them just because this procedure should be done by the most experienced provider. But needless to say, we uh, this, is, this is within our scope of practice. So if you're in a community hospital or if opto is not available, you should be able to know how to do this. Um, we'll go over just the steps, but just to kind of go over the basic anatomy, especially the anatomy that we're primarily concerned with in this procedure, uh, you have your lateral canthal uh, ligament, which looks like a, sort of like a wishbone on its side, and it has a superior and inferior crew. Um, and this is sort of uh, the area that you're going to be cutting the inferior crew and sometimes if need be uh, the superior crew as well. So what is uh, the issue with orbital compartment syndrome? Why is this a concern? Um, so basically you have some sort of injury or insult to the eye. And then what ends up happening is you have a, a rupture of one of the blood vessels, typically the infraorbital artery or the anterior posterior ethmoidal artery. Um, you get bleeding in this very like small confined uh, space, which causes an increase in intraocular pressure. Um, and then you get uh, reduced perfusion and ischemia of the optic nerve um, and the atrophy of the optic nerve. And if this isn't corrected, you can get permanent blindness. So I am a sucker for memory aids. I just, it just works for me. So um, ways, I kind of came up with something to help uh, you remember if you think this is, you know, orbital compartment syndrome. So we have the five Ps and that consists of um, pressure. So an IOP greater than 40 um, is concerning. Uh, pupils, if there's an aff uh, afferent pupillary defect. Uh, proptosis, so like the, the globe is really um, protruding outside of the, of the eye socket. Um, this is a little bit of a stretch, but visual impairment. Um, so decreased visual acuity and then paralyzed uh, restricted extraocular mus uh, movements. Um, there are other findings as well, like if you um, feel like these are like rock hard, um, tight eyelids, if there's like periorbital bruising, um, if you are an astute provider and you bring out the fundoscopy, you might see like optic disc swelling or just like vascular edema um, and chemosis is also a finding as well. So what do you need to do a lateral canthotomy? You have your essentials, which essentially can be found in like your uh, lac repair kit and CCT. Um, and that includes your uh, like your uh, hemostat, your suture scissors and forceps. Um, additionally, it's going to be helpful to have some sort of like anesthetizing agent with epi. Um, this is a very, um, uh, this is like a highly vascularized area. So you want to try to control the bleeding as possible. So it's good to have um, epi with that. Uh, 10 cc syringe for your, um, for your Lido with epi. Uh, 18 and 25 gauge needles to draw up your Lido and to administer it. Um, some sort of antiseptic agent, sterile gloves, sterile towels, uh, four by four gauze. Um, additionally, it's helpful to have someone assisting you, uh, somebody holding up maybe the patient's head, manipulating the eyelid, passing you tools. Um, you want to have good lighting. Sometimes this procedure is also done under procedural sedation. Again, this goes back to you want to make sure that there's no delays in doing this. So if you can set that up, that's also fine. Um, but if you are going to do procedural sedation um, to uh, to refrain from using ketamine because that's supposed to increase intraocular pressure. So just briefly going over the steps um, of what this looks like, and then I just have a short snippet of it in real time. Um, but starting over here, you this is your you know Lido with Epi, and you really want to generously apply um, near the orbital rim to sort of numb up the area. 
Then with your hemostat, you essentially uh, like crush the lateral canthus for about a minute or so. Um, and one thing that was taught to me was it's not even just crushing it. You want to clamp, unclamp, clamp, unclamp, clamp, unclamp, because that's supposed to also help devascularize the area. Um, once you've done that for about a minute, you take your um, suture scissors and you cut from the lateral canthus to the outer orbital rim. That's usually about like a one to two centimeter, centimeter um, cut. Um, afterwards, um, it's helpful to have forceps to help you visualize the lateral canthal ligament. Um, the forceps are also helpful to um, get some tactile feedback because uh, this, the, this part of the lateral canthal ligament apparently feels like uh, guitar strings. Um, so it'll help you visualize as well as give you that tactile feedback. And then essentially you're going to go for the inferior crew. You want to cut that. That should be enough to decompress the globe. But if not, then you want to go ahead and cut the uh, superior crew. Um, additionally, it's important to have all your instruments facing uh, inferiorly just because that decreases your risk of nicking like uh, neighboring structures like the lacrimal gland or lacrimal artery. So, just a video. Oh, where did it go? Oh, it's hiding. Okay. Yeah. That's what that looks like. Okay, so that's what that looks like. Um, so once you do your procedure, how do you know that it worked? Um, as mentioned in the video, you can check your intraocular pressure again. Um, if it goes down, you know that it was uh, successful. Um, additionally, if the patient, um, if there's improved visual acuity, now keep in mind if uh, the if the patient has gone for a prolonged amount of time with this increased intraocular uh, pressure, they might have lost their vision. So that um, may not be a sign that it. Um, additionally, uh, you get resolution of the afferent pupillary defects, and then essentially the it's almost like the proptosis resolves it, as the globe kind of moves back into the uh, socket. You have like the lid margins moving immediately to the temporal limbus, which is where the sclera and cornea meet. Um, as with any procedure, there are complications. So that includes like bleeding, infection, um, although rare, you know, further globe injury, um, incomplete catholysis. Uh, there's some cosmetic complications. So like the, the process of this can cause the lower eyelid to droop and you sort of get um, exposure, ectropion, which is like exposure of the uh, inner portion of the lower eyelid. And then again, um, you know, damage to neighboring structures like the lacrimal artery or lacrimal gland. 
So what do we do next when all this is done? Um, if Opco has not been consulted, uh, you should definitely be getting them on board uh, just because one, um, after you do the lateral canthotomy, they're gonna go in to actually repair what's been done. Um, and additionally, uh, these patients might be admitted to their service or the trauma service for um, serial uh, compartment checks um, and like serial IOPs, just because you know these patients, uh, you could possibly have a recurrent uh, um, orbital compartment syndrome that happens afterwards. Um, and if these patients are still like in CCT while you're waiting for their disposition, um, you obviously want to control their pain, uh, elevate the head of the bed. If their blood pressures are elevated, you want to manage that. And you want to prevent any further increase in intraocular pressure. So if these patients are nauseous and they're vomiting, um, if they're coughing, if they're straining because they're constipated, um, you want to uh, tackle that because we don't want a further increase in IOP. So when do you not want to do a lateral canthotomy? Um, the setting of the globe rupture. So that was kind of like the situation with the case that I had earlier on. We weren't sure. And if we had done a lateral canthotomy, that could have been problematic. Um, the reason being with a globe rupture, you basically have um, intraocular contents that are essentially filling out and you might not be able to visualize that. So by doing a lateral canthotomy, um, you're increasing the risk of further um, traumatic uh, injury to the, to the globe. Um, ways to tell that this is a globe rupture that you're dealing with and maybe not uh, like orbital compartment syndrome is if you see um, in the setting of blunt trauma, you see like a hyphema, um, if you see um, evidence of like a pupillary defect, like you see in some of these images, um, if you see an obvious like penetrating like foreign body, like a nail in the eye, um, some conjunctival hemorrhage, a positive cytosine, um, spilling of extraocular content, these are all signs that um, this is a globe rupture that you're dealing with and you shouldn't do a lateral canthotomy. And patients that you want to consider um, that are uh, at risk of orbital compartment syndrome. So if this is a patient, like we mentioned earlier, um, who experienced some sort of blunt trauma, um, and then other patients that you kind of want to keep in mind too, um, especially in our elderly patient population, uh, the, in the integrity of their blood vessels are weaker, so they're at increased risk of bleeds, especially even in like low um, uh, in impact mechanisms. Um, they might be on blood thinners, so also keep that in mind. So just basically some take home points. Um, this is a procedure that you want to do in the setting of like orbital compartment syndrome. Um, consider your five P's when you're thinking about is this a situation of orbital compartment syndrome and I might need to do a lateral canthotomy. And if opto is in house, consult them. But if they're not, you don't want to wait for any delays. And in terms of the procedure, you always you want to start with cutting the inferior crew first. If that's not uh, sufficient, then you go for the superior crew. And don't perform if you suspect that this is a globe rupture. And these are my references.